Samarzoba, and welcome to the History of Sacarvelo, Georgia. I'm your host, Roberto, and this is episode 22, The Conversion of Cartley. In this episode, we'll cover some of the religions prevalent in Cartley during Mirian's reign and the political reasons for the nation's conversion to Christianity, as well as take a step away from the chronicles and the legends for a hot second. Before we continue, we need to spread awareness of a brand new Aristavi joining the nobility of the Georgian kingdom. For his services, Mark will be promoted to the rank of Aristavi and be dubbed Aristavi Malkaz Netaria Shwakhevi. You will get access to bonus episodes. Thank you for your support. You too can join Aristavi Malkaz on Patreon to get access to bonus episodes and a royal name. You can also become a Spaspetos so you get to vote on topics for future episodes and get access to our Discord server. Links are in this transcription. In the last few non-myth episodes, we learned more about Christian Orthodoxy and Zoroastrianism thanks to the expertise of Father Christos and Trevor Cully. A big thanks to both of them for their willingness to take the time to sit down and chat with us. We also left our narrative off with the death of King Mirian III, but a big question still haunts me. Why did he convert? Well, we'll answer that in a moment after we cover Zoroastrianism, Manichaeism, Armazism, and Christianity. First of all, I'd like to give thanks to Professor David Brown and Professor David Marshall Lang, without whom this information would be unavailable. Thank you so much for all the work you do. To start with, we need to reflect back on the first 30 years of Mirian's reign. Things were fairly stable, and the Aristavi were still controlled by the monarchy. The Aristavi's positions as ruler were not yet hereditary, making it much easier for the monarch to assert power over them. Aiding the Iberians' years of prosperity were the Sassanids' near laser focus on their war with Rome in the late 3rd century, putting less external pressure on Cartley. Sure, they were still a vassal state for the Sassanids and fought for them occasionally, but they weren't at the forefront of the war against Diocletian and Galerius. With the Sassanids' loss to the Romans and the resulting Treaty of Nisibis in 298 AD, the client status of Cartley switched from the Sassanids right on over to the Romans. This left Mirian III as a Zoroastrian and Armazi ruler in a land of Hellenic paganism that was quickly becoming Christian. Armenia, Cartley's southern neighbor, converted in 301 AD under the rule of Tirdat III and the guiding light of Gregory the Illuminator. It would still be some time until Mirian made his own conversion to Christianity official. From his ascent to the throne in 284 to his conversion, which we talk about soon, Mirian was a staunch Zoroastrian. We can see the influence of the Sasanians in Cartley thanks to a list of the network of fire cults and priests established in and out of Iran, inscribed by the Hyamagus Kadir sometime in the 280s. As Trevor mentioned in the last episode, Cartley falls outside Iran along with other Sasanian territories such as Armenia and Caucasian Albania and other captured Roman territories. Kadir's whole view of what constituted in Iran and outside of Iran wasn't exactly political, but more ethnocentric, and he didn't consider the Kartveli to be equal to Persians. This same inscription, however, does give us evidence of Kartli's client status under the Sassanids in the latter half of the 3rd century, thanks to Mirian's placement on the throne. Persian influence was religious as well as political, as Kirdir was a zealous Zoroastrian, which he made sure became a dominant force within the Sassanid Empire. It wasn't the only religion though, as Christianity and Manichaeism were making an entrance into the region through Rome and from Iran itself. Zoroastrianism was quite important within Kartli and Colchis, having been established there for centuries. There are silver dishes from Kartli that depict fire altars in their medallions. Other artifacts include mounted warriors, one of which is identified as Mithras, accompanied by astral symbols, especially that of a crescent moon. Another common depiction found in artifacts is that of the bull. It appears often in the iconography of Colchis and Cartley in very prominent positions. Due to Georgia's placement at a crossroads of empires, it's difficult to categorize the bull as Hellenistic or Zoroastrian in nature one way or the other. The bull is also quite prominent in the cult of Mithras, 
which makes it important in understanding the role it plays in the Caucasian region. Depictions of the bull did extend its influence into Christian Cartley, as the Svetich Haveli Cathedral in Mitesieta is adorned with the bull's heads. The last one most commonly depicted is the stag and deer, which were a royal animal for the Persians. Within Cartley, the stag also held a high place in society, to the point where it predates history. In Georgian tradition, the stag can be occasionally associated with the sun, like we saw back in the legend of Parnavaz the first hunt before he found his wealth. In northwest Caucasus, stag heads were used to adorn churches in the area, and in Iberia, a church in the town of Atani has a depiction of an archer galloping after three deer, shooting arrows at them. Another similar hunt can be found at Nikorsminda. But what is the most distinct depiction we've encountered throughout our exploration of Georgia's many faiths? Why, that of the tree, of course. This was a prevalent pagan symbol which was adopted by the Christians. Don't forget about the cedar tree that was cut down and turned into a pillar and raised by Nino's prayers either. Legend has it that it was a cedar tree brought from Lebanon and planted in Cartley right on top of Christ's tunic. This tree also contained healing powers once it was shaped into a pillar. This is why the church was named Svetitz Kaveli, which means the Church of the Living Pillar. And need I make mention of the tree that Rev the Second cut down? It supposedly bestowed healing and protection to those that ate from its seed and leaves. This tree was turned into several crosses, and those who touched it were healed. The Ormazi also considered trees to be sacred and worshipped beneath them, as they naturally sheltered everyone beneath them. Occasionally, rags were tied to certain trees as a form of silent prayer. The prime site for this can actually be found at the Javadi church, which contains a cross within it that overlooks Mitesheta. Trees were also burial locations in the old days. It's reported in both Jason and the Argonauts and by Herodotus that men were giving sky burials while women were buried underground, additionally showing the importance of trees to this patriarchal society. And that's pretty much all the information about Zoroastrianism and Paganism I'm going into without stepping on previous episodes. The Iberians were more than likely introduced to Christianity by the missionary Manny, who founded Manichaeism, thanks to Shapur I's influence in the early 200s. Manichaeism obviously recognizes Christ as the Messiah, but took in Zoroastrian influences by worshipping light and frowning on things such as carnality. Thanks to the Black Sea and its status as a territory of Rome, Christianity was already deeply rooted in Negrisi, or Lazica as I told myself I'd be calling it ages ago. There was already a church at Nakalakevi by the 4th century, which is when the Byzantine authors say the conversion of the Laz and Apshils occurred. It didn't help that the Eastern and Western Georgian churches remained separate because, in Kartli, a Georgian alphabet and Georgian liturgy soon followed the conversion of Mirian, Nino, and Georgia as a whole. In Lazica, however, the liturgical language remained Greek, much to the chagrin of the locals. The common religion of Christianity did bring the regions closer together and allowed many Georgians to find fame abroad, such as Ibagrius the Iberian, a 4th century ascetic residing in Egypt, and Peter the Iberian, the founder of a Jerusalem monastery and great nephew of Erasbakur II of Iberia. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. Georgia's conversion to Christianity is honestly a major turning point in their history and had a long-lasting effects on Georgia's art, literature, and lifestyle. They decided to take a more Roman perspective on things as opposed to the Persian influence that they've essentially had since the start of their kingdom. As we discussed in an earlier episode, the story of Georgia's conversion heavily involves Saint Nino, who managed to convert the Holstroid dynasty. This story is brought to us by the church historian Rufinus, who wrote it down from an account of a Georgian prince named Bakur, more commonly known as Bakur the Iberian. I covered Bakur in our Patreon episode. They met in Palestine, and due to the proximity and time from the conversion and when he would have heard this tale, we can call this account fairly authentic. While the chronicles make it seem like Kartli was a heavily pagan nation, it became apparent that many of the Kartveli were actually already Christian, while Mirian and his family were late to the conversion game. Thanks to this Kartveli conversion, the Georgians and Armenians became a Christian outpost in the East, distancing themselves from the Sassanids and Islamic influence of the Arab world. As they moved more towards Christian cultural and political centers instead of Zoroastrian ones, 
they had a complete change in their social and material way of life. Rome had a profound influence on the monarchy as the Kartveli kings turned away from the theophanic foundation of their religious beliefs and the cosmocratic claims that they created in the first century AD when they called themselves great kings. The days when Mama Sakhalisi, or father of the tribe, was the first among equals were completely forgotten. Instead, alongside Greek and Persian influence, the monarchs reframed their political power in predominantly Roman terms. The divinity of Augustus during the pagan period helped justify a move towards more absolute power, while the choice to have seven Aristavi reflected the seven planets in Roman cosmology. The break with Armazi also coincided with the arrival of a new dynasty, the Hosroids, right after the demise of the Parnavazid dynasty. Mirin was the first Hosroid, as well as the first Christian ruler of Kartli. Of course, being a Hosroid marked them as a branch member of the Mirinids, one of the seven great houses of the Sassanid Empire. See how the number seven keeps showing up? Overall, the Kartvelin kings must have adopted Christianity for political reasons. As I mentioned earlier, most of the populace had converted, so it only made sense Constantine's Edict of Milan in 313 AD let Christians finally see an end to their persecution and a chance to get their property back. This, along with an intense amount of military triumphs and the founding of Constantinople, allowed the Caucasian nations to discard their pagan and Zoroastrian faith for Christianity. The historian Melikishvili claims that the Georgian nobility converted quickly to displace the wealthy pagans in their lands, and there was a time of civil strife in eastern Georgia during the conversion period. The lowlanders, those in the valleys, easily converted. But those in the mountains took longer to convert, and it took until Varaz Bakur I to finish the conversion process. It's always mountain people that are holding out longer than everyone else, isn't it? The Zoroastrian religious elite was replaced by a Christian hierarchy, and every town where an Aristavi held power, a bishopric was formed. Thanks to this, quite a few Greek words entered the Georgian vocabulary to help describe the clerical terms of the church. But when exactly did Kartli convert to Christianity? This is when it gets tricky. It's usually mentioned to be around 334 AD, but some chronological markers complicate this. For example, there are mentions of an eclipse that covered Mirian as he was hunting. The only visible eclipse that year would have been visible no nearer than Alexandria. On the other hand, 317 is a year when a total eclipse of the sun was visible around Metasieta. This is where we enter a rough patch, because if we go with the 317 date, it predates the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, but it does fit the account of King Tirdat III's conversion in 301. One counter-argument to the 317 date is the fact that the Georgian torch records date the first Archbishop of Kartli, Ioannis, as being in office from 335 to 363 AD, which would put the date at 334 AD. My only concern is that the legend of St. Hypsomy and Nino's supposed involvement in that may have skewed the date slightly, but all those events were meant to take place during Diocletian's rule. We don't have a definite answer, but we can say 334 for our reasons here. In 338 AD, Mirian, as per usual, fought against the northern Caucasian tribes because they were always switching from ally status to invader, and so on and so forth. If anything, you can count on them switching sides when you don't need them to. After Constantine's death in 337 AD, Shapur II started a 25-year-long war to regain the lost status of the Sassanids in Asia Minor and the Caucasus. In order to keep peace in his lands, Mirin III tried to balance appeasing both the Shapur and Constantius II. This went so far that the Kartveli received gifts from Constantius II to stop them from going over to Shapur's side. Talk about what a great, yet terrifying position to be in. Mirian died in 361 AD and co with his son, Rev II, for 16 years. Rev II was married to Salome, daughter of King Tirdat III and his wife, Queen Ashken. Rev perished before his father, and they were both succeeded by Saramag II, Rev's son. To see images and bibliography related to today's episode, please go to our website to check them out under the episodes page at historyofsacredvelo.com. It contains all the links to our social media and email contact information. Sacredvelo is spelled S-A-Q-A-R-T-V-E-L-O. 
To help this podcast continue, please feel free to donate to the podcast via Coffee or PayPal. The link is in the episode transcription and on our website. Our Amazon wishlist is also available if you'd like to purchase the book for us. And we do have a Patreon and just released a, an episode on Peter the Iberian, so go check it out. I would also like to make a quick podcast shout out and recommendation. I am recommending the Spanish Arpada, which is a Rexipod ranking all the rulers of the other Iberia, Spain. Sarah and Peter are a hilarious duo, and they are currently ranking the Islamic governors of Spain, so check them out. The best way to help us is via review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your preferred podcast host, as it goes a long way with getting the word out about the show and helping us to reach new people to learn about Georgia. Madlba la nachfamdis, and thank you for listening to the history of Sacramento, Georgia. See you next time. <laughs> Yeah, I'm